comes in five, four, three, two. Hello, everyone. Welcome to your creative journey live. My name is Kevin Gregg. I'm still Paul Carganilla, even on YouTube. Even on YouTube, you, you are. Uh, we've even got a special guest with us. It's Thomas Schulteis. Hi, Thomas. Hello. Five, four. How are you, man? So glad to have you here with us tonight. Thanks for um, having me. Hey, gang. We got to say hello to all of the good people that are visiting us here on the YouTubes. Uh, and even the bad people. And, and even the bad people. Here's the deal. I got to make sure that I also mute myself so that it's not coming through my stuff. Uh, we got to say hi, Angelica. Glad to have you here. Hey, folks, if you are joining. Hey, Meryl. Good to see you tonight. Uh, we've got some people that are watching us. If you have any comments or questions as we're doing our interview tonight, please feel free to drop them in the comment bar and we'll be sure to, uh, you know, get to it and have a great conversation. You know what I say? I say we just jump right into this. What do you think? It's yeah, unfortunately it's a hot. It's a hot day. Mm -hmm. Poor Thomas. He's up and he's in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you could tell. Yeah, maybe you can see. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little warm. It's a little warm in Studio City. How's it for yeah. you out there in Moore Park, man? It's probably not as warm as Studio City, but you know, when you're not running your air. <laughs> I get it. Well, that's what I'm doing right now. All right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna jump right into our audio podcast and we're gonna have oh. He's messed around with his, he's messed around with his gear. That's how he does it. All right, here we go. In five, four, three, two. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your creative journey. My name is Kevin Gregg. And I'm Paul Carganilla. Thanks for joining us on the show that is designed to help you get your creative work done, whether you're an actor, writer, singer, dancer, musician, painter. Paul, what else could they be? A soap boiler, <laughs> billboard installer, braille okay. proofreader. Braille proof rear. I love that, man. A faller? A faller is a, that's a that is a career. Fallers, better known as lumberjacks, so they tricked oh, you there. Uh, yeah. Seismograph shooter. Yeah. Embalmer. So, okay. Oh, underwater yeah. demolition diver. Ooh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of cool things you could be, and this could still be the podcast for you. It really could be because you know what? You could bring your creative spin to it. That's what we do here every week. We help you to make sure that you get your work done with a creative spirit. We, we don't judge what your passion is. We just no. want to help you get, get into it. Yes. It's a good thing, right? The odd thing is that people don't realize this, is that no matter what your job is, is that you can find the creativity in it as well, right? And it's a way to be able to speak to people. Speaking of speaking to people, we've got a fantastic guest that's with us tonight. He's a teaching artist. He's been a performer. I, I, we're going to learn so much about him tonight. Uh, and he's got a fantastic event that's coming up in a few weeks. I can't wait to unpack with him. Ladies and gentlemen, it is teaching artist Thomas Schulteis. Hi. Wow, that applause. I want to carry around a little applause machine now, I think. <laughs> Pretty fancy. Hi, mm -hmm. Thomas. Hello. Welcome to the show, man. So glad Hello. to have you on with us. Thank you for having me. My gosh. I think that this is going to be a great conversation. Thomas and I have known each other for a number of years. Mm -hmm. We uh, first met each other through Disney Performing Arts, mm -hmm. uh, which was a program that's used as sort of an outreach to uh, elementary, middle school, high school level kids. Um, to give them uh, and basically an art experience coming down to the Disneyland Resort. That's right. um, and we're gonna we're gonna not not just unpack that, but we got to talk about a lot of stuff from uh, your history as a creative, mm -hmm. some of the Disney stuff, but also the stuff that you're doing. But most importantly, Thomas, we ask this every week: What's the best thing that happened to you this week, man? This week, I'm gonna go. To, can I go to Saturday? Does Saturday count of as a week so far? Because I mean, it's it's, it's Tuesday. With, yeah, it's within a seven-day cycle, you know? Okay, then I'll take that. So the, the, to keep the long story short, um, so we're basically in this foster to adopt journey in terms of, of kids. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, there are several that are kind of showing up in our world. And we're currently able to um, wear a mask, but have in-person events where we're getting to interact with some of these kids. 
And yeah. so on our horizon, we have um, the potential for, you know, another, another child to enter our life. How many children do you, uh, your husband? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many, how many children do you and your husband have? So we uh, had a one foster son that lived in our home is now 21. And then we have another one that we've worked with through a program yes. more as kind of hen- uh, mentors as well as um, dads. Um, and he's currently 16. So we have them okay. involved, but we've got now an empty room in our home mm. and looking to kind of move forward. So yeah, that was pretty, it was pretty interesting on Saturday. Now, Thomas, we're, I'm, I want to unpack a little bit <laughs> with, with you, if I may, yeah. if I may. Yeah. Um, it's what, what inspired the two of you to specifically do that? To specifically, because fostering, fostering, and now you're doing fostering to adopt, but fostering, maybe explain that to some people that are just going, what's the difference between adoption and fostering? So fostering, we, we, we decided to begin the journey back in, I think it was 2014. And um, if anyone has seen the movie Instant Family, we've watched that numerous times. And we actually say it's about 90% accurate in terms of the experience. So if you want to dip your toe in kind of a light entertainment version of it, check that out. Is it um, a movie? Is Instant it's a movie. Inst- Okay, Insta Family is a movie. Okay, yeah, gotcha. with Mark Wahlberg and Rose Byrne. So, gotcha. it's really well done. They clearly worked with social workers and foster kids, etc., through the development of it, uh, foster families, because it's it's evident in the movie. But anyway, yeah. so we started in 2014, and it came from this idea that we, as we were uh, allowed to be legally married, and then we considered, hey, another possibility is that we have children, and so um, we long story short, (laughs) kind of discovered fostering, but there's a lot of training that goes involved. So really we started in 2014, but we didn't get through all the training kind of our timeline until about 2015. Okay. Um, And then believe it or not, it was about another year and a half beyond that when we get kind of almost placements Yeah. until finally in um, it was the beginning of 2018. We literally got a, got a text from our social worker that said, there's a 17 year old Mm -hmm. in high school Mm. needs a placement. What do you think? And we were like, gulp. (laughs) Um, Right. And we said, yes. And then the next day they brought him to our front porch, which was. Wow. But um, so he, you know, he he lived with us for two years. He graduated high school. He has got, he went on to a technical college uh Mm. it's called universal technical technical institute to learn automotive um you know he's had some challenges but even those places that he hit it turns out statistically are so hard to do um he's still in our lives we just saw him the other day and um he's getting more in construction Um, i love it yeah so anyway so that's my but my buddy doug wriggles on the uh, i've been working on a project with him and again he's he's right there with you he's done adoption foster adopt already a fan and he also mentioned the movie the instant insta family says so great instant movie. family yeah instant family and great i should movie. plug i should plug the organization too that um please that we discovered as a new it, well they've been around for 20 years for us it was a new approach to fostering where they it's called kids save and what they do as the model is it's for older kids. So it's nine to, to 18. Um, they work in different parts of the country. There is one located here centralized in, in Los Angeles, but they give the kids a choice. Mm. So you go to these events and then the kids actually choose who they want to continue to get to know. Hmm. And that's it's like, it's like speed dating for kids. Okay. Well, you know, people say that, but I, I, I think I, there was, there was a, there was another comparison that now I've forgotten what it was about right. what it's more like. It's almost more like finding um like a good collaborating partner. Let's keep it in the creativity piece. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, but, but for these kids that have so little um, personal agency over their own lives mm. to have that, choice yeah. is extraordinary so we yeah. found that that's informing us as we move through this whole process so any any kid or kids that are brought to our attention we say to them we want their choice to be a part of this yes we want them to have a, a, a choice throughout this part and it's really been a, an, an incredible part of that amazing that, 
experience. Yeah. It's such such a great thing. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm completely speaking out of the realm of experience, but just even the conversations that I've had with Doug over the last year, there is such a massive need for this. It's extraordinary. There, the need is extraordinary. So massive. Yeah. There are so many ch- children and teenagers that are at this stage that have like, and especially when they get out of the, you know, the cute baby thing and getting into the kid stuff and especially all of these kids and young, basically young men and young women that, you know, they're getting prepared to go out into the world. Yeah. And if there's a way that they can do like what you guys did to be able to set, set your son up for what do you, do you even refer to him as your son? I guess you'd kind of, do yeah. That. You know, I mean, the movie kind of even touches on it too, where it's like, is it okay if I call you son? And, uh, you know, it, it's something you have to navigate. I mean, the whole thing is like a navigation. It's a study in kind of communication and navigation. Um, you know, on this past father's day, he shows up. We didn't even know he knew it was father's day. And uh, when he was leaving, he hugs us and he wishes us both happy father's day. So, Sweet. you know, I mean, there are ways that it just evolves in its own yeah. path. Well, amazing, man. Just thank you so much for sharing that. I think that that's just, it's so important and so necessary. So I, I want to say one more thing on, be- on behalf of the older kids. Yes. Because both boys said to us, obviously separately, but they both said to us, why didn't you pick someone younger? Mm-hmm. And the response that we gave them was because you showed up. <laughs> you showed up it wasn't yeah. the age you yeah. did yeah. but it's interesting because it's true as they get older they get they hear they know like oh mm. uh who's gonna take me in yeah and um uh, and so that's also why there's such a need for the older kids because there's this general idea that they're like oh younger's easier younger's this younger's that yeah. but we've had you know incredible challenging incredible rewarding experiences with yeah. these kids that are you know teenagers older mm-hmm. they need that love man they need that love I and know. that direction and that guidance that's I mean, it that's right. what it is. they need somebody to follow through and show up so what that's... happened this past saturday what was so what happened this past saturday and here's where it gets more complicated right this kid save program also has a segment that brings kids from columbia if you can imagine so they have different mm. like affiliates around the world. Yeah. And there, you know, there were two boys that were at this event that are a little bit older and um, we interacted with them. And so we're exploring this possibility. They currently only speak Spanish. I so was wondering. <laughs> there's that. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole process. It's a whole thing. It kind of goes for, we were learning about a year, but again, we're trying to be open to, the right match showing up for all of us. And so what was really fascinating is we never had entertained that idea Hmm. and then found out that we could attend this event and we went and it really was eye opening. Um, You get a real sense pretty quickly about like, yeah, this maybe can happen. So Hmm. when you said what was good this week, that that's what I thought of. That's amazing. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thanks for asking. You bet. Yeah, it's good. Good for you. Now, let's t- let's let's go a little bit back for a second. <laughs> okay, Thomas, I get to find out some stuff about you that I don't even know. You okay. started out. You started out your career as a as a performer. I did. Uh, where do you Where do you hail from? And at some point, you were even treading the boards in New York. Correct. Yes. So um, I moved around a lot as a kid because my dad worked for IBM, and the way to move up in that company is you move. It turns out. I don't know how much that still happens, but um, so the long story short is that I, we ended up in Virginia when I was 14. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess what was significant about it is it was a fresh start kind of for the whole family and for me. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that's where that began, Virginia, and a little town called Midlothian, which is basically a suburb of Richmond. Okay. Um, and it turns out that we had... Um, we had really incredible arts teachers there. I had an incredible theater teacher and an incredible uh, choir teacher that wow. they set up an environment that transformed my life. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. That's where that's where it all started. Was it sure. specific? Was it specific shows or just being in classes or? Um, 
I'll tell you an anecdotal story. So I came in as a you know freshman and sat down with a guidance counselor and school was getting ready to start. And they go, um, hey, <laughs> you got all these requirements, but you've got a place for an elective. But the only choices we have for you, because I, I guess I was, I was registering late in the season, um, they said is typing or drama. <laughs> <laughs> this is true and i was like no. uh, <laughs> right okay. typing or drama so okay. what i want to tell you is that the truth is um i was a shy kid at 14 yeah, yeah. i was not talking a lot yeah. the fact that i put pick drama is still a shock to me yeah i guess that i thought that typing was going to be um, more mundane i regret that i still don't know how to type as well as i should because of that decision <laughs> but that that little choice right that little moment yeah. where it's like here are your two choices and pick one or something like all right um changed the trajectory of my entire life that little bitty moment wow who knew who knew you that you never know i know you never know I mean, I got, listen, I've talked about it before on the show here. I went to an all boys Catholic school here in Los Angeles and I did not go. I went to Loyola high school and mm -hmm. uh, I ended up, yeah, my junior year, I ended up getting, um, I ended up getting into uh, the school play when I was like a junior because one of the priests said, you need to audition for this thing. And I went, (laughs) okay. And I went in and I, I'd done some stuff and I'd done some stuff and, you know, with my church and all that stuff before, but that show was the thing that kind of set me up because afterwards I had people coming up and talking to me and like, Oh, you really need to pursue this. And it was like, ding, like a light went off going, okay, maybe I should, you know, and so, weird. And oddly enough, when I submitted for, when I was submitting for cl- for colleges, I submitted for colleges. I thought I was maybe going to go into something like graphic design. I thought I was going to go into that. And I'd actually, I'd accidentally, put in theater arts you accidentally put it in i accidentally put theater arts in my college application so i got accepted into theater arts program and i went okay let's go with this wow see See, that's the stuff i'm talking about now wait what was the what was the man's name who said you should do this play it was uh hold on a second father oh my gosh oh my gosh he completely uh, it, it might it may come back to uh, father carol father tom carol father, father tom, tom carol, carol. Yeah. i feel like it's important to honor those people yes. that did those things so i yes. will shout out to mrs Catherine bulger yes and miss mrs michelle graham who really the two of them were like i said they they ended up being transformative for my life wow. I, and i think that honoring our teachers or mentors yes. is part of the work that i do now and it's so yes. I think it's funny. They have that ability that they, that father saw in you. He's like, there's something in you, you should go be here in the play. Yes, yeah. totally, man. It's amazing. Yeah. So you go, so you end up going through high school and then was the fact that did, did you end up going into a college career with this as well? No. So, um, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> which is no. So, um, so what I, what I want to touch on real quick is, um, so freshman year, you know, it was quiet. The teacher even said, you barely spoke a word. She, she's like, I think you spoke five words the whole year, and which is probably true. Cut to the next year, I decided to, yeah, you know, I, excuse me. I did do the musical that year. They were doing My Fair Lady, and mm-hmm. I was cast as the, it was the first time I did a role. I was cast as um, Doolittle's sidekick. I mean, I, okay. I had Harry, Harry was on the thing, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it was basically ensemble and I had like a little feature, yeah. but, um, but I loved it. It was just, I was, I was just like joyous. But then my sophomore year, they that these teachers decided they're going to do a production in suburban Virginia of the Wiz. Now, we weren't a predominantly African American school. Sure. There, there was some diversity, but nowhere near sure. there where there probably should have been. Ease on down um, the road, man. Ease exactly. on down the road. <laughs> short, I'll keep it. I'll keep it simple. But it, it's a big, uh, basically, a signature story for me. I auditioned for that show as the yeah. quiet little and drama kid and they cast me as the scarecrow. So the next thing I knew they, this back to your thing, right? They saw yeah. in me something yes. I clearly didn't see. I, yeah. I didn't know what was happening when mm. they handed it to me. I thought that Scotty Smith was going to get it because <laughs> he was talented. He was yeah. also African-American. I was like, everybody we like, we knew he was going to get it. Yeah. She announces it in the auditorium and everybody turns and looks at me and they're like, who? <laughs> um, I mean, and that it's the truth. So oh. piece about teachers and educators yes. that they see 
potential in students uh, is is a is a real special skill. Mm. I don't think they get acknowledged for as much, but yeah. they they saw me. So yeah. So yeah. to jump to the college, no, I didn't. I I I emphasized my focus, believe it or not, because I had been really academic to that point, and the arts felt like, oh, I'm dabbling in it. You know, in high school, I'm just kind of dabbling. So I ended up pursuing uh, a degree in psychology through through college, believe it or not. And um, now I have to tell you um, this. I have to tell you this because first of all, Doug, I've got a friend of mine, Doug Riggle, I've been working on a project and he's all the way out in Ohio right now. So he sent he sent something into the thing. He said, well, I might check it. I might check it out tonight, but it's going to be late. And he literally said this. He said, I was going to go to bed, but I have to watch this all tonight. And he said this. Thomas, you sound like a parallel version of me. Someone oh. talked me into auditioning for a play yes. in 10th grade. I got the part. Uh, it changed my life. Yes. And, he, and he was also in The Wizard of Oz. Oh, that my gosh. Guy. He played <laughs> Uncle Henry. He played Uncle Henry in it. So. Now, look, this is a side. This is a side. But I was literally having a conversation with uh, this, this, this woman that I know t- today. And I asked her about, like, something she did in a transformative show she did, too, was Wizard of Oz. Now, Crazy. I'm not saying that that's the ultimate transformative show. But clearly, <laughs> clearly, there's something going on there. Because um, I know that it is really powerful, impactful for yes. a lot of people. It is. Story. So you, you ended up you ended up getting into psychology. Yes. How the heck do you make this entire jump that ends up getting you? Because you end up becoming a professional performer in mm-hmm. New York. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the choir teacher I mentioned, one of the things we had in tandem with the musical theater experience is we had a show choir. Um, we ended up doing really well. I've got a sh- I've got a shout out to um, the choreographers that came into our world with the Wiz and the, and the show choir. Their names were um, Harry Bryce and Martram Gales. They showed up and kind of blew our minds and changed the entire trajectory of so many people that I know from that experience. Mm. But so from the musical, they, they choreographed the Wiz. They then were asked to choreograph the show choir and the show choir had been developing. But by the time we did it my junior year, um, we started to win awards. And then by my senior year, we won a couple of the, the championships. Wow. So we had this, again, this little tiny suburban town in Virginia, all of a sudden we're shooting to a level that we didn't expect. Now, the reason why I say that is that when I went to college, I went to James Madison University in Virginia. And at the time they had a college level show choir called the Madisonians. Yes, yes. And there were 20 of us and we had to audition. But if you think about it, in that kind of tri-state area, there weren't a lot of art schools that people were drawn to. So it turns out that that particular geographic area attracted what turned out to be an incredible amount of talent that showed up in this choir. So I'm studying psychology. I get my degree in psychology, but simultaneously from my sophomore through my senior year of college, I was in this, what I look at as a fertile musical theater training ground Mm. through this college level show choir. Mm. Um, Some of the most talented people that I've ever met, I worked with in that group and um, about half of them went on to do Broadway as well. Wow. Isn't it amazing that sometimes that that happens? Like sometimes you happen to arrive in a place. I remember being at Cal State LA and like the timing that I was there, you know, my first couple of years I was there. And again, it's kind of like, it's like, it's like a working man's college that's right in the middle of Los Angeles. And you don't think like, you don't, you know, the average age of students at that time was like 26. But for some reason we had a pocket of people that were there for a couple of years and people just like going, let's do this. Let's get in. Let's work. You know? I gotta t- I gotta tell you this story. So, Please. so there's a um, who, who's become like successful actress and and um, talented, but we would, during our rehearsals, her name was Kenna Ramsey, is right, Kenna Ramsey. We would literally stop wherever we were in the room and we'd run to the mirror and face back to watch her perform. Wow, she was that good. She was just yeah. like, and we would just stop. And I remember thinking, I wonder what it's going to be like in the real world. Mm-hmm. when we meet like the real talented people not realizing that in that very room i was going to be speaking to like a future joanne and rent that i was going to be watching someone who was in that thing you do that yeah. is now sings back up for stevie wonder i'm like yeah oh i was in the room and i didn't even know it Mm-mm-mm. and here they are so yeah that that interesting part of the story i had how much control did i have over that i mean it, i just no. showed up you know mm. We, I mean, we could, 
we're probably going to talk about this a little bit more in depth and I'm just going to brush on it right now. But that idea of these teachers that were along the way in these key moments and meeting these people in these certain areas that were so passionate, driven, and just going, Hey, we're treating this like a real thing. And I have, and I know that you're going to expand on this more Thomas, but I have to say this in general. Because I was just having this conversation with another client this week mm-hmm. because I've been finding myself pulled into different businesses and everything. Arts education is so vital. It is so vital. Essential. And the stuff that people want to throw out and to go, ah, you don't need it, right? But to go, hold on, man. The craftsmanship, the foundational elements that are in there that you can use and you can see it lacking in, in certain aspects of business. This isn't to poo-poo business, right? But the fact is I come across so many people that just like, just, they, they, they don't know what to do. No. They don't know how to do this to talk to a camera or they don't know how to be on their feet or thinking on their feet mm-hmm. or having a presence. Or, or creative problem solving. Creative problem solving. And this is the big shout out to go, it's essential. It's essential and especially treating it like the, with the skill and the craftsmanship that it, that it deserves, right? Exactly. That it needs that. I mean, I remember, uh, oh my gosh, what's the name? Uh, so David Mamet, who is the director, and then who's the, oh my gosh, I'm going to completely forget his name. Uh, he's, he's the guy that's on Shameless and he's uh, the mustache and, and you Fargo. William you would H. see, H. say it again? Thank William you. H. Thank you. William H. Macy. William H. Macy talked about the first time that he ever met David Mamet. I think he was like in a community college somewhere in Mm. back East, Mm. but you know, David Mamet was like, I feel like David Mamet had been like military at one point, like ex military. Mm. And he walked in like literally in fatigues because he was, you know, off of assignment. And he basically told the entire class in this like acting class to go, we're doing this and we're bringing the, you know, the type of respect and attention that it deserves. And if you're not willing to do that, then get out of here right now, you know, and really bringing that type of seriousness. And I understand that there's a level of like compassion that needs mm-hmm. to happen with mm-hmm. creatives, but there is so much necessity to form, building your stuff, working on your craft and those people that support that that are striving to have people push themselves and become the best versions of themselves yeah. because the world needs that. Totally. And in my view, one of the things that I've learned in, in my lifetime so far is that arts education isn't just for future artists. Arts education is, should really be for everyone. Mm-hmm. We should all be, have access to it for all of the potential ways, like he's all the things you listed, as well as like coping, as well as processing, as well as forward thinking, all of the, there are so many things that are, that are part of the benefits of it, but in a, in a more broad scope, I can't think of anyone that wouldn't benefit from arts education. Mm. I agree. I, I, I was literally having a conversation with a, with a businessman the other day. And I will tell you, I was absolutely, I was so impressed with him. He's a guy that I'm working on a project with. And he, um, he took a Meisner class. Mm, like yeah, he, yeah, took yeah. A, he took a Meisner acting class so that he could be in the moment and to focus and to do the things that are necessary. And my gosh, he was using stuff. Sorry, you're hearing my son in the background. <laughs> but but He's like, I want to be heard. <laughs> Let me in, will you? Hold on. Dad's recording. He's Please. like, I want to be creative too, Dad. <laughs> Get out of my room recording, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Deal with it later. I'll give it to you. I'll give you, I'll give you some more allowance. Get out of here. Exactly. Uh, but the but the idea, this guy that took like this Meisner class mm. and mm. was like absolutely using it in his day-to-day business stuff. And as I was hearing him do like the real, I was so impressed. I was like going, yes. Like he was talking about like using Meisner techniques of like being in the moment and noticing things and affirming certain things. And he's doing it in his regular life. And I'm going, yes. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, it's awesome. I mean, it's so beneficial for so many reasons. Really, really good. So, 
you end up jumping. Sorry, because we're we are going to have to jump. We're going to have to jump okay. to some stuff. How mm-hmm. the heck do you get from psychology into performing in New York? Uh, so I graduated. Hooray! Um, <laughs> but just before I graduated, I was uh, hired, uh, like in October of the year before I graduated, to go help open a show at a park called the Fiesta Texas in San Antonio. And it was called Rockin' at Rockville High. And um, little known fact is that one of the publications, it was the same year that I think Fantasmic maybe debuted. Okay. And it was actually voted by this publication as, as better than that. So mm, watch out for Good that. Good for you. I know that's, I know that's controversial. But uh, <laughs> watch but, out. Here comes Barnett Ritchie. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. But it was, um, it was uh, another experience of a tremendous group of people that they brought from around the country that had this extraordinary talent. I mean, just crazy people. Um, one person who shot to, to a little bit of stardom and now is going to like a power, like one of the biggest power broking agents is Joe Mahota. He was, um, he ended up being the original Sky on Broadway, but then kind of moved out of performing and then moved into um, being an agent. I think he's with CAA. Yeah. But anyway, so again, like this next level of people show up at this, you know, theme park. Um, and long story short is there was a segment of us that when the, our term there ended, we decided, hey, what are we gonna do now? Oh, let's go to New York. Like, it was kind of like that. We're like, yeah, we're gonna go give it a shot. So there was a caravan of five of us that literally drove to New York in a U-Haul to get an apartment and try. Wow. That's true. And I remember I had $500 in my pocket. Okay. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So what the heck happened when you showed up? So who, who the heck got the apartment? <laughs> yeah, well, the, the five of us split an apartment. So we, yeah. the five roommates. So imagine that. Even then the rent was just like, oh, like, what are we signing up for? Yeah. Um, but what I'll say, so, so keeping it kind of real. So yeah, I got there. And um, the first thing I did was like this children's show that was traveling to different parts around the country. It's the Thomas the Tank Engine, yes. um, where I played Casey Jones, the engineer. And it ended up being like, not so great, like managed, but the opportunity flew me around the country. I was making really good money. I was singing and dancing and, you know, having an opportunity to do it. So I did that, that kind of ran its course after about eight or nine months. Then I did a couple of regional theater productions. I did a production of um, Leader of the Pack. And then I did a production of Good News where I left, met some of my still now closest friends in that production in Virginia Beach. Yeah. And then, yeah, I was the guy that um, went to an open call audition. Greece was already running um, in New York. It had, it had been running and I had even seen it. And I remember sitting in the audience going, oh, I think I can do that. So um, <laughs> honestly, there were a couple of auditions that happened previously that I didn't, I made it far, but I didn't get it. And then I went this one day and there were like 150 guys and they all look like me. Um, and they were looking for, you know, greasers or, you know, hot, who could also be high school students. Right. And at the time I could do that. Um, and I, I got to tell you this story. Okay. Yes, please. Because it's a, to me, it's the craziest story that was so true. And I'm like, what is this about? And I told some students when they're like, I want to go to Broadway and tell me a little bit about what it's like. And I'm like, sometimes this story comes up. So cut to 150, right? Mm -hmm. That same day, we're like 12 hours in. We've done everything. We've sang, we've danced, we've acted multiple times. And then, you know, to be considered a singer who moves well means a double pirouette. Yeah. So, you know, (laughs) the stakes are high and you're you're literally like, you got to do all your tricks, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we get to near the end of the day and there are six of us. Okay. We're down to six. And this is a true story. Three blondes and three brunettes. Okay. And they bring us all backstage and they go, they've made a cut. At this point, we're, it's like 12 hours in. We are exhausted. We have given everything we possibly know at this point. We're literally on the stage of the Eugene O'Neill, right? Well, this point we're backstage. And they go, they're keeping the brunettes. That moment. Yeah. I don't even quite know how to explain it now Mm. even, but that's exactly what happened. They cut the blondes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and what's also weird, you want to hear this weird part? 
I know the brunettes and what happened in their careers. The blondes, I don't know what happened. Wow. One of the brunettes went on to play um, the Prince Eric in Little Mermaid. Another one went in and was also in Greece with me. Wow. And I'm just like, that is the weird to think of everything stacked up to that moment becomes a hair color yeah. cut, cut. I was like, yes, what is this? And that's such a like just a cross section, but just a moment right. that like totally just shows you what the business is. What the business is, Paul, right? Where you're just like so arbitrary that you go, how can it be that these decades of work and all this dedication and the family's tears in the audience and all of that stuff leads to this moment? There was a guy, God rest his soul, he's the casting director for MASH. His name is Sam Christensen. Mm. He used to teach classes here in Los Angeles. This casting director on MASH had won like Emmy recognition for his work. And he told, he told our class a story. He said once, he said, let me tell you how this business works. We had these women that were coming in for like a nurse role that was on the show. And we were, we were getting down. We were down to about the last five people. And uh, there was this one way. And, and he said, like he said, I was in the room. I'm in the room with the directors and the producers. And I will tell you, we saw those last five women that were coming in and every single one of them could have done it. Mm-hmm. Every single one of yep. them could yep. have done that show. Yep. And then uh, they finally picked one of the, one of the ladies and Sam asked the producers and directors, why did you pick? And they said, you know what? Um, she just had this moment where she just kind of paused for a second and was just really thinking for a second and really, and it really worked for us. So he's talking to the actress about this saying, congratulations. And you know what? That little pause that you did was just amazing. And she went, oh, I was so, I'm so massively sick and I've got a bad head cold and I, I got caught up for a second. I was afraid I was going to sneeze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and yet that was the thing, like and the producers the and directors just went amazing, amazing. I, and you go, okay. <laughs> I know it's that stuff, right? That's that stuff that, it, you know, they do talk about that though, in the concept of you do the work so that then when those maybe arbitrary moments show up, you're still ready. Yes. Some, some artists get so offended when you tell them part of it is luck. They're like, yes. no, 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 I it's all it. skill. It's you're all like, come on. And- it's a little bit of luck. It's a little bit of luck. It might be a lot of bit of luck sometimes, but it could yeah. be a lot of bit of luck. Like that day, I go to the audition. I mean, I got dark hair. I mean, you can dye your hair. Yeah, yeah. I've I've literally gotten jobs. I've literally gotten jobs, and then I got off the phone. And I thought, did they make a mistake? Like I thought, have they <laughs> me for that? Yes, yes. I remember. I remember having it, and I'll tell you. I guess it works, man. I will be generic with this as possible. <laughs> People can find out what this is. Right. The but research I now. had, I, I had, I'll tell you what, man, I had to do a commercial. I was in the commercial. I was in the callback for the thing. And the actress that I was cast against for this product, um, she wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise on the thing. Uh, like she was improving, She was doing all this stuff, you know, again, so it's hard. a, you yeah. know, it's, it's a husband that's made a choice with a, with a product or whatever, but like, she just, the, the audition at that point was all about her. And I just went, ah, okay. And I just could do, it. and they cast us, they cast us for the thing. And I was basically the henpecked husband of the thing. Yeah. And then we get to, and then, <laughs> Then we get to set and then she starts doing the same thing. Like she starts doing the same thing and she's, you know, she's trying to do all this stuff yeah, to get like, all I the, got the gig doing this. She's, I've got the it. gig. I'm doing all this stuff. And wouldn't, you know, they end up spending most of the commercial just focused on my exasperated face. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> and I was it? just like going, I just, I, this That's, is the hard, this is such a hard day of work. I need to get out of here. And it yes. ends up like they completely focus and go, yeah. perfect. That's what we need for this commercial. That's what yeah. we need. I know, Paul, to your point, I feel like the, luck is part of it. Yeah. It's timing and just like the randomness sometimes. And people don't like it because you can't control that. Mm. And it, you can't like, uh, nobody's discounting. You need to do the work and do the work prepared for that moment yes where luck comes into play but part of it is luck part of it is luck yeah. and that's the part of the surrender where you're like 
that I don't have control over. You make this transition that goes from being a performer and you kind of end up going, we, we really don't have to go too deep into this. I think the things I would love to touch on this are, it's the, you, you, you work at Disney, you end up, you end up getting hired with Disney and you're mm-hmm. working on sort of a, it's, it's a mixture of creative and business. Mm-hmm. How was this? Why did this happen? What what were the changes that were going on in your life? And then also we can also talk about some of the lessons that you've learned throughout this because we, we you and I were talking the other day a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say that, believe it or not, what you know, and I'll say this in my workshops because it's another true story. Um, before I, you know, when I was in Texas and before I moved to New York, I would turn to people and I go, "Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to do a Broadway show." And then I'm going to go work for Disney. So just something you had in your mind, just something you just said, I want to do this. Yeah. And, you know, I say, of course, there are things, right? I don't know if you've heard this. I, there's some re- research that says you can help achieve some of your ambitions by verbalizing it. Mm-hmm. Step one. Step two is you write it down mm-hmm. as like, you know, another thing to do. But the third one that really helps to make more come true is you post it. Mm. So I mean like old school posting, not like social yeah, media yeah. posting. Uh, like you putting post it up it, somewhere. Yes. Yeah, where you can see and, it. And um, I'll tell you, it's a funny thing. I read that. I learned that. I heard it. I use it. It is the simplest little thing. And what I'm surprised about is how few people do it. Mm. And I think it doesn't take that much effort to say, write, and post something. But even that, I think somehow people have to make a decision like, is this something I really want? Um, but for me, I was like, oh. so anyway, bring you back. I, to, you yeah. say that right now, Thomas, and you cannot see it, but I am literally looking at three pieces of paper that are up on a door right That's here. It. And I will tell you what these three pieces of paper say. Okay. This is also from my, from where I am as a, yeah. as a Christian and a Catholic. God is who you're responsible to. Second piece of paper, you are priest, prophet, king. You have a place in God's royal order. Claim it. Third one. You don't have to please anyone. You don't have to prove anything to people. Mm-hmm. Those are my three pieces of paper that I'm looking at on the, that they've been hanging up there for over a year. So people, it, like, yeah. people like to kind of laugh or scoff at the secret, but I think so much of that is true. When it could be like, I think largely because when you're doing that, when you're making your vision board or when you're saying yeah, yeah. it out or when you're writing it down, you're bringing it into existence you are like putting it into the world. It's not just in your mind anymore or just something that you want. It's something that is physically in this world. And even like, even a vision board just keeps you focused on a goal. Uh, Like it's just like little things like that. Either you're looking at it every day and you're just putting that energy out there or it's driving you. It's driving you or that manifesting concept, right? That you can help to manifest. So listen to this, because Paul, when you said about the, the, um, you said about the secret, but then you said about like um, kind of bringing things forward and someone just, I think it was just, what did it have been like two weeks ago? Yeah. A teacher that I know that's completely amazing, right? His name's Paul Meserly. And he says, he goes that he has this kind of mentor that um, brought this concept, but like they were discussing this concept and her response to him was, she goes, when you have a thought You've already created it. Mm-hmm. The thought is the creation. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it becomes about like making it, like bringing it to life. And I was like, what? Wait a minute. When you, wait a minute, when you just think something. So it's just, it's been tripping me out a little bit because it's a similar concept, right? It's like, it shows up in your world somehow in your mind and spirit and shows up. And then you kind of get to decide, what am I going to do with it? Yes. And you have to grab it. Like when that pops in, I mean, listen, for me, man, I always called it, I called it like left field Holy Spirit thinking. Like, honestly, it is something that has come out from somewhere else. It's come from from. something bigger for me. And it is literally trying to say, hey, I need this in the world. Mm. Hey, I need this in the world. And to your point is to go, what you just been given a gift. You've literally just been given a gift. What are you going to do with that? You know what who does some really that? interesting work on this is Elizabeth Gilbert. Have you yes, heard about her? Big, big magic and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Oh my happening. gosh. She does some great stuff. She's got a couple of really great um, 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 TED Talks on 
YouTube and her book, yeah, Big Magic. She really does some fascinating um, stuff about people and how ideas show up and the way they can be transferred and just that the ideas are abundant. It's it's really fascinating. So, but, it, but there is also even that thing that we're just talking about for those of you that are watching this right now. There is a responsibility on your side too, because it's also not just about saying staying in the staying in the staying in the dreaming part of it, right? right. I think what happens is, and I, we've seen this happen with some studies too, people get this idea and they almost get the same excitement as if it had happened. And then that's it. Then they go, oh, that's yeah. amazing. I can yeah. envision what this is. And then they do nothing about it. And then yeah. it's just gone. You know? And some of it, you know, if you go on this Elizabeth Gilbert concept, it's that some ideas, they, if they feel like where they are, isn't, they're not going to come to life, mm -hmm. then they'll find somewhere else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So it, yes. I find that kind of fascinating. She actually talks in the book about she knows a moment when one of her book ideas was transferred to another author yeah. when they like hugged at one point and then uh, like a, a couple, year, <laughs> right. literally a couple <laughs> years later, the idea came to life in this woman's book. And she's like, I know when that happened. happened. They were friends. So they were, they yeah. were, they were already kind well, of. Friends. You know, the interesting thing is I'd written a book. I'd written a, a small book about this as well, which is the interesting thing is that you're right. That's going to come. Th some version of that's going to come in. But you know what? You know what your version isn't going to come in. The version that you would have had your right. unique that's voice, true. That your is unique true. voice, and thing. And so what will happen is a version of it's going to come in. But the version that was uniquely, specifically your voice has now gone. I know, and that's you why know? people are filled with regret, right? Because they're like, I didn't do that. But but that's the whole thing to be able to go. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on. Okay. That is a thing that happened to me. How can I learn from that? And how yeah. can I grow from that? Totally. Like, you know, right. crazy. You can't, you can't do them all. <laughs> no, you can't. And I mean, it really, there is something to be said about discernment. You know, you really have to do yes. discernment and you get have to make true, choices. You, you do. You have to get very specific about it because you could be saying yes to a million different things. Greg McEwen has a book that's called Essentialism, which I think is so important. Mm. It's really this idea of really honing in on that thing that you do the best, as best as you can, right? Because yeah. we get so scattered. But if we really hone in on that thing that we're really doing well, we can really excel. Yes, yes. Um, so I didn't quite... I didn't quite answer your question. That's okay. Because you talked about... It was exciting. You were telling us about how you wanted well, to go to Disney and you put it on a board and that took uh, us on a tangent. I know. So the, the <laughs> thing that I want to share though, I thought I, that, that may be interesting to your, your readers is limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. So what happened for me at Disney is that I come there as you know, a creative performer, but I didn't want to do that at Disney. I was interested in kind of taking another path. Um, and so, the, again, long story short, yes, I ended up getting involved with the Disney Performing Arts program. And I found at the time when I kind of entered the program and through kind of not the end, but the middle, it was this extraordinary group of people and playground of like discovery and really like trying to find the quality and the depth of the experience, the arts education. And everybody was like sharing in that mission of this is really a positive impact on the world like the work we're doing has a really positive purpose and there was so much alignment and so some of the best people that i know or have been involved with that program um and but what personally what i came in contact with was this limiting belief mm -hmm. and i'm going to share it with you Please. because for me it was a little bit like whoa so I had told you that I had been academic up until my like sophomore junior year when I got more involved in the arts. What happened when I started to look for colleges is I had a guidance counselor who didn't really know what to do with a creative arts student. So what she said is, you know, your grades have gone from straight A's to you've gone to like A's and B's and it's like declining. And she's like, so those top colleges you have on your list, you should wipe off oh, because they're not going to accept you. Mm. And I wiped them all off mm. and cut to like 20 years later and I'm sitting mm. at Disney and I have to confront the fact that I had this belief from that moment mm. 
that you can't be smart and be in the arts at the same time. Mm. Mm-hmm. No, it's ridiculous when you bring it to light, when mm-hmm. you go, oh, look here, you know, mm-hmm. you can be, you can be intelligent yes, and creative can. and an artist, but I didn't have those people around yes. to say, oh, you're emerging as this creative artist. Yes. They didn't know what to do with me. Nope. So I found my way. You know, I don't really hold like, oh, what if I'm but I will say it's a cautionary tale because I lost a lot of time and had a lot of self-doubt and a lot of struggle because of those very concepts, right? Mm. Like you're not this, but you're do do do. And it's like, yeah. Yes. So it's the contrary oh. to the story of someone not seeing what I was bringing to the table. So imagine I'm at Disney and I'm like, wait a minute, that belief isn't true Mm. so all of a sudden my mind switched and i was like what if i'm both what if i can be academic and what if i can be creative and what if that's okay but we're talking decades gentlemen yes Yes. hey thomas thomas talk about limiting beliefs i mean i kept i'll have to tell you with all due respect, with all due respect to my experiences I had, I was waiting for someone to give me permission. Right. That's some of it. That's I was, all it is. I was waiting for someone to give me permission and somebody to go, here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Or go now, you play, can, Kevin. now you can, now you can do play. this. Now you can do this. Here you go. Right. And I was waiting and I spent a few, I spent, I spent several of my, my last few years as a performer really kind of pushing that to a uh, not a great place for myself. Yes. And I remember having a moment, <laughs> I'll be as generic as I can, but I remember having a moment. And again, this, the thing is this, is that I've met some incredible people through Disney. I really have. As right. in any organization that you meet yeah, over the absolutely. times, you also meet challenging people. It's going to yeah. happen in any organization any that you meet, any environment that you meet. But I remember I was having a conversation with somebody specifically where I had where the thing snapped. And I don't know, you know, I'm I could I've gotten better at it, right? But there's definitely the part where the where the Irish ire comes out of me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I had a moment where I remember telling somebody, I'm done playing your game. I'm done with this game where I feel like you're having me play something here. And I feel like every time I'm trying to go down this path Mm -hmm. that you're telling me I need to go down, Mm -hmm. that you are changing the rules and moving the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I'm done. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm taking off and I'm splitting. And for me, for me personally, I had to put, it was literally what I had to do. I'm not suggesting that for anyone else, but that was the journey that I had come to, which is literally God saying, they're not going to give it to you. Like they're not, if you're waiting for them to say it's okay and we're going to make this stuff happen, that's not how this is going to be. My life has been a continual series of, it really has been a continual series of like just stepping off into a stepping off the cliff. (laughs) Yes. And knowing that I'm going to be caught. Right. And like, and, and that has been my journey because for me, I feel as if God's saying, you've got to trust me. You've got to trust that I'm not going to let it you It takes such courage and vulnerability. It is petrifying. It's horrifying. I am so I am so grateful to my wife that she married an insane man like me. <laughs> because the fact is the the blessing and the encouragement and the the, the what what <laughs> I have put her through. But the stuff that I have come to her and she literally comes back and says, I'm not. Sh-, and at times has said, I don't know if I fully understand it, but I know that you won't steer us wrong. Go for it. Amazing. It's told me that time and time and time again. Okay. You know, she need, you need to get her flowers for that tomorrow. Well, tomorrow's her birthday too. <laughs> oh, so. get her more than that then. I will. You know, Kevin, what, what, um, and we might've talked about this, you know, um, a couple of days ago when we were just initially talking, but one of the things that your story reminds me of that I've learned during the pandemic, it's, it's a couple pieces, right? One is um, I'm not interested in the entire like world getting what I do. 
Mm. I'm interested in the people that get what I do that are like interested in it. And I'm interested that it's like a mutual thing. That's really great that I want to go into the rooms that I'm welcome. I want to go into the rooms where I'm encouraged, where they look at me as a full functioning human who has so much bring, to bring to the table and everyone in the room feels that way. And that's what it makes me think of, right? When I look at this part of my life as a teaching artist, that, that those are the opportunities and the people and experiences that I am drawing to um, because life's short. Yes. Yes. Hey, we're not going to get, we are not, it's not going to be perfect. We're not going to get everybody that we want, but when we do run to those, when we do run to some of those troubled people, we can also reframe the way that we look at it and go, cool. What's the lesson I'm supposed to learn here? What am I supposed to go? But to your point, I want to be, I want to be working with people that I want to, I want to log time with. Yes. I want to log, not only logging time with, and it's not just about like, oh yeah, I want to feel good and hang out. No, 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 no. I want to get into this iron sharpens iron thing where I'm going, let's play, let's play, let's get better. Let's do the stuff. Yes. You know, I want to, I want to leave. I want to get to the end of my day and go, that was a long day, but boy, I'm grateful I had it. Yeah. Boy, I'm grateful I had it. And you mentioned the boundaries, you know, I just, that same event on Saturday, I won't go into too many details, but I stepped into a space where I basically put up a boundary and I was like, the energy that's coming from this particular situation, I'm not going to have anything to do with. Yeah. And for me, that, you know, the 14 year old quiet kid that you know, was took drama over typing, it's a big step for me to just like get more clear about where those boundaries are mm-hmm. to protect also ourselves and our creative selves. To protect ourselves, we mm-hmm. sometimes need the boundaries. Yes, we absolutely do. Big shout outs to this. Holly's on here. Love you, Holly, dearly. My parents thought the arts were important, but not a career path. Mm. Now my job is perfectly suited for all my skills. Ooh, great. God bless you, man. Yeah, that's She's awesome. amazing. Um, Thomas, here's mm-hmm. what we're going to talk about. What are you doing now? Mm. And what is this event that's coming up soon? What's you've, you've had this transition. You've had this transition that's gotten you, you're, you're away from Disney and you're doing your thing. What, where are you right now? What's happening well, with you? Look, first I'm going to change my background. Ta-da. Uh, uh, there you oh, go. oh, this is it. He's got his, he's got his event up there. Look at that. I love the bokeh. The educators collective, the yeah. educators collective. So, you know, I mean, of course, everything like takes such a circuitous route to get there. But what I will stay and keeping succinct is that um, let's just gently touch back on what I talked about near the beginning, right? About like who recognized in all of us, probably arguably, we don't know Paul's, I didn't hear Paul's story yet, right? In terms of someone recognizing in you things that you're capable of. But teachers and educators have a very a very interesting place and they are tremendously hardworking, but that, that one little piece about recognizing in students, things they don't see in themselves. So what's kind of evolved for me over um, really the pandemic, I guess, honestly. So I've been teaching as a teaching artist and I've created different workshops. Um, I've got a musical theater workshop that I do I have a workshop called Let Me Try That Again that is about processing perceived failures or setbacks. Say that one more time because that's a really cool phrase. Say it again. Let me try that again. So it's about processing perceived failures or setbacks, um, maybe limiting beliefs. Um, And what's starting to evolve with the curriculum is it's turning into opportunities for creative expression. So that's very exciting. Um, I also created during the pandemic, a TikTok workshop. Yes. Uh, (laughs) It's called TikTok musicals, exploration and activation. And I was asked to do it by an organization called musical theater competitions of America. Um, They, excuse me, they asked for something and I gave them proposals. And that was one of the proposals because they TikTok 
you can have all kinds of opinions about it. But what I was recognizing is that these younger performers are getting a platform to creatively express themselves in yep. ways that haven't existed before. And Correct. I found it can, to be endlessly fascinating yes. that true, like, just like going for it was happening. So I created this workshop and um, I've taught it multiple times virtually. And so that's been an interesting experience. Um, and I like the agility of it. I say agility to you, Kevin, and I, with a knowing, with a knowing wink to you um, of being able to move through something quicker than like multi-year process. It's more like multi-month process. And that's Seriously. been very exciting. Right. Yeah. So what some of this work has, has ultimately led to is that a, there's, there's kind of a, if you look at it as a, let's call it just a little circle of students and teachers and community. And I'm working on different aspects of each one of those. So the workshops were generally student facing, although some of them apply for teachers as well. But the educator collective, educators collective came out of a concept that teachers do not have the space, the safe space, to gather together mm. to talk about their, yeah, sure, their challenges, because they clearly have had them, but to talk about ways they can support each other, yes. ways they can learn each other. And it's like a collective wisdom. Mm. So what I did as a, as a kind of progression is I started to have these monthly gatherings. There's an author named Priya Parker who has a book called The Art of Gathering, and I was completely fascinated by it. It's an incredible book. And um, I've taken a lot of her teachings and, and applied them. And um, I wanted it to be that teachers could come together to have a safe space to connect, to kind of re-energize, to just be seen and heard. And um, so I've done several of those uh, over the months, but what it's culminating to is this Ed Educators Collective Virtual Summit that I'm doing August 6th through the 8th. It's totally virtual. When I was deciding at the time of doing this, COVID was starting to, to subside right. and people were talking about opening up events. But in my gut, I was like, I'm not sure in August where we're gonna be. So I'm going to stay on the safe side to keep moving forward. And now with this kind of resurgence, I'm glad that I did. And plus my participants are coming from Florida and from Utah and from, um, from Illinois. So they're coming virtually from around the, around the country, but I'm, I've set it up as a three day event, but mostly Saturday. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to create a different experience. It's intimate by design it's customized and it's personalized and so um in a general way um i am bringing educators kind of really tremendous edu educators together for these days right to kind of yes. share the things i told you we're doing but what i've also done is i brought in a kind of a, a team of guest presenters which i'm completely excited about yes. they're tremendous people all of them and i'm just so excited they're they inspire me and I'm hoping they will continue to inspire the participants. Um, and I've got these like surprises of things that I built into the, the experience that are hoping to connect people on a, in a virtual way, but deeper. Um, to be quite honest, I'll, I'll take this as an example, right? Like this genuine conversation the three of us are having. Yeah. It's an example that in these virtual spaces, we can still have genuine connected conversations so i'm trying to move those same kind of concepts to this event and have um people gather together and kind of be surprised and delighted i am using kind of bookending both the educator experience and the student experience okay. so that they talk about like who's inspired them as educators and then the students that inspire them and it kind of like interweaves that way so that it really to me is a conversation that doesn't have, happen a lot Right. Um, we've talked about it a little bit today where how many times do you, do you get a chance to have a teacher and a student kind of talk about each other? Mm -mm. So I'm trying to create spaces like that where oh. people can connect on these oh. transformative relationships and experiences and, uh, and like I said, just like a little, I send them the surprise box that has things that they will open throughout the weekend that oh, I are love it. <laughs> connected or not connected to what like it. we're doing. Um, so I'm really trying to break open the virtual experience, but yes. still make it feel special and memorable.
I'm telling you, Thomas, people are starving for this in education. I've been working with a, uh, I've been working with a math education company for several mm, months. Right. You said that. Yeah. Yeah. And several of the things, like, especially the things that I see throughout, you know, North America and some different countries in the world is this idea of teachers trying to come together and share ideas of things that work yeah. because especially when you're talking about the arts, especially when you, and, and we, we don't have to just sandwich this into the pandemic, but the pandemic really quickened a lot of stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah, it it, it really, really did. did. Yeah. It slammed everybody into like, learn how to learn how to be virtual. Right. Yep. Yep. And teachers had such an immense challenge. Yeah. And I know several performing arts teachers that just went, how am I doing this? How am I doing like, this? Like I'm stuck here and I've like, got kids and I've got some kid. And listen, I've heard of some school districts throughout the country where it's like kids are allowed to mute their cameras and their audio during a class while you're doing an acting class. Right. How do you do this? Right. No. <laughs> Not like, in my workshops, not my right, workshops. Exa- right. So, but like literally like these challenges that these teachers have been bound in and like extraordinary going- challenges. I mean, they were literally, they're, they're building the plane as they're flying it. They, That's they, it. They had to, they, they were put, putting the, fixing the thing over here while they're like spinning the yes. propellers. I mean, I, what, what they accomplished is. Yes. And yet there's moments and yet there's moments where there are these gems and these hidden discoveries that have yes. happened throughout this, which are like, oh, right. Like these little sparks and these little ideas. And I'm going to use, I'm going to use math education as an example, because we see this happening in the, in math stuff. Right. And I do think that there's, I do think that there's part of this that ports over into uh, that parts over into arts education mm. because so many kids that are out there that think I can't do math. I can't do math. I've got yeah. math brain. It's just all my stuff. And these ideas of what they're doing, of what teachers around in, in different parts of North America and around the globe are starting to go, hold on a second. What do you know? What do you know? Mm-hmm. Hey, verbalize some of your thought process. Hey, guess what? Even at the process that you're talking about, you're part of actually this math community. You're actually contributing to this. You're actually doing something amazing. And how many times have we had that, especially as performing artists, when I've been doing these classes or stuff, or anybody that's either on this call or, or you've been in a teaching position, where you get that one win from a kid yeah, yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. that one win from a kid that's like either shut down or angry or whatever. And then they finally have just a little bit of a break. It makes it all worth go. it. Yeah, That's it. Here we go. We just move the needle a little bit for you, right? That's exactly right. And the fact that people could come together, the teachers can share those experiences, but that also you have people in a student space, in a space of trying to learn and saying, how do I get better? Yeah. How do I get better? Yeah. Or here's some stuff that I think works for me. Is there anything out there that can help yeah, me? Yeah, because I'm having them specifically bring their best practices to it. I, I ask them in an information form ahead of time, Think about your best practices because it's going to be a part of what it, we're going to share during the event so that mm. at the very least, they're going to walk away with hearing from other leading educators. What are they doing that's working? What are mm. they doing that's working? And uh, yeah, you know, when you talked about the math stuff, I, I, I have to give a shout out to one of my close friends and collaborators. Her name is Lori Barber, and she has a very passionate um, uh, drive towards it's kind of like you say with math and she says it with art and she says how many people when they draw something they're like oh i'm terrible at drawing i'm so terrible at drawing and her response is it just takes practice she's like i've been practicing she'll look they'll compliment her and go you draw so amazingly she's like because i've been practicing and she's trying to bring it down to be just like so clear. And I think when you said the math part, I'm like, it's a similar thing. Now you can add some complexity, sure. But it's also the same thing, like practice. And we get so far away from that it just takes the work. Yeah. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that I shared well, that. We, we had a guy that was on here uh, a couple of months ago, Jeff Watts, who talks about sweat equity. He talks that, about yes. the idea of sweat equity, That's of it. the idea of like, you know, showing up and do, and I think that part of that is about, we don't want to sound like old guys on the porch, do we? I don't want to sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> and in my day, you in my kids, day. 
Rob but Stallions. it is, but it is in this day of instantaneous and everybody wanting the results immediately. And sure. it, oh, it looks so easy because well, that's what and, we're fed too. You know, but and getting. that's but also that's an element of this show, man. An element of this show is to continually peel the curtain back. Yes, and to go show up, show and up, do the work, show and show up. up and do it consistently. Yeah, do it. If you I know, show like up, we were you talking do- earlier with Paul, where it was like luck i mean so yes luck but part of the luck is you show up that day <laughs> right. yeah, yeah because think of the people that didn't you know how many people didn't when no. you showed up think about the ones that didn't no you're already increasing your odds that you is know? it man you just continue to show up you show go, up i'm gonna I, keep doing this that is the <laughs> I, I feel that with my shows with my podcast so stuff true, where i just right? kind of go show up show up up. but listen man i have to do a thing you know talk about behind the scenes stuff you know i've got challenging things where i broadcast here out of my home we've got stuff that's happening where stuff's going to be shifting around at times maybe not so much for the your creative times but i do another podcast as well i can't set up in here that's going to be coming up i literally have to grab i do a live stream i'll do a live stream tomorrow i think i'm doing a live stream at eight o'clock in the morning i will literally grab my dining room table which is probably a good 75 pounds. I drag it into the living room. I take a couple of chairs that I put up on there. I put up my standing desk thing. I put up my lights. I do all this stuff. I roll the things out. I take up my entire living room. I broadcast for my 15, 20 minutes. And as soon as it's done, I tear it all down and I put everything back in the thing. I do that three times a week. You think that there's times I don't want to do it in the morning? You're damn right. But I show up and I do it. It's not pretty. (laughs) It's not. The creative process is not pretty. No. And we've talked about that so many times on the show, like especially like, you know, with um, I I, I feel for teachers so hard with everything that's happened since the pandemic hit my both of my parents are teachers. My brother's a teacher. Mm -hmm. And just like we we on, on my YouTube network found a way to to make YouTube and Zoom work for performers. But then at, at my regular nine to five job, I'll be visiting classrooms and seeing what teachers are dealing with and just going, I think it's rough for, for us trying to put on a show. These teachers are trying to teach and inspire students. That's and, right. Um, you know, students who already don't have enough discipline to sit in a classroom Mm -mm. but yet to sit in their kitchen and Mm -hmm. listen Mm -hmm. ain't working anyway uh, i i jumped back but oh gosh now i lost my train of thought i was saying oh so like you find the people who are not who are willing to take the risk and put in the work um you know knowing that you have no idea how this is going to turn out you're going to fall on your face. You're yeah. going to be embarrassed. You're going yeah. to feel like what you just put out there was shitty and sorry, crappy <laughs> you, and embarrassing. You, you, you. Mm-hmm. But like, it's part of the process. You it's can't part of get the better if that doesn't no. happen. No, no, no. It doesn't. It, and we don't, you know, what, what doesn't get the attention are the struggle, the, the <laughs> unglamorous, the mundane, yeah. the, the uh, administrative the the kind of you know chaos that sometimes ensues that doesn't get the attention and neither does like i i've been really digging into this concept of um of incubation like we there's so much driving forward in in our culture yes that we forget the pause which i think is what's interesting about what happened with the pandemic we were forced to yeah. um and so i've really been looking at the creative process and how incubation is actually an essential element. Mm. We just don't really think about that very much. It's like, say, I just immediately, I thought about like some good meals. Like if you're making a really excellent sauce you, or something like that, yes. you, gotta let it, you gotta let it simmer. Simmer. You gotta let it simmer. Or how many it's meals are better simmer. the next day when you've let yes. them sit? They gotta rest. They but gotta rest and let that, that stuff like, soak go, in. Go, go, go. It's always like, go, go, yeah. go. Not, you know what? You know what is actually best for this creative endeavor? is for me to step away from it. Yes, correct. It's like, it's like it feels like it's against culture to do that. How many times have I done that with writing where I'm trying to force something, right. trying to bang my head against the wall, and literally, for me again, the voice of God saying, go to bed. No, go, I can't. Leave it. Go to bed. Let it's it. so true. And then you come back the next day and go, oh, and it unlocks. 
you but it's the same get... thing. It's that same thing, right? We were talking a little bit with like the auditions and stuff where you can't, you can't control it all. No. And that's what's so challenging about the creative journey is you can't, you can't control it all, but can you do the work? So when those moments arrive, you're at the very least like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to build this plane while I'm flying it, <laughs> you know, because otherwise you're like not even at the airport. Well, you have to be prepared for that stuff. I think that that's the thing that happens as we're building and doing and creating our stuff is that we're also training ourselves for the moment when that hits, for when that hits where you go, we, it's going to be a fine balance between, Hey, I've got to let stuff simmer and, Oh, I just got hit with something and I'm ready to, I'm ready to adapt with this and improv on the fly. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. This is not going to flip me out. No, exactly. And, and I should, here's just some, another funny thing, right? When you're talking about, it's just like, where you land, when you're born. My mother was a teacher, a preschool teacher for 30 years. And my father, I told you with IBM, but his second career was as a consultant. Hmm. And so me, I'm like, oh, I'm a creative, I'm a performer, I work for Disney. And all of a sudden, I'm literally a combination of the two of them. And I go, wow, that's, a, that's an interesting, that's an interesting stretch. So you know, of course, everybody has their their own paths. But for me, that's been an interesting kind of anecdotal piece that I go, oh, I learned in that environment from really both of them um, about let's make a craft for my mom. I can make a craft out of an egg carton. I can tell you that much. Um, <laughs> so, you know, our environments, too, there's just so much. And I think that's to me why art education for everyone is so important because arts education, because not everyone has those environments where you're going to discover things. Uh, and, and, and that's why I think it is so vital. And I know I'm kind of circling that back around, but it's true to the work that I do. And, and the work that I do, yeah, I am trying to create, help to, to continue the ec- ecosystem so that other people get those transformative moments like I got. Mm. so that mm. they get those moments that I, they are the 16 year old or whatever Jeez. age that like the teacher goes this and the student goes, I can't believe it. And the next thing, you know, the whole family cries and everybody, you know, to have those environments continue through the teachers, through the community, oh. through the students. And so I find that I'm really going back in some ways home to that concept of this is where it all started. Yeah. And having those opportunities, it's paying it forward. It's trying to engender and encourage and, and inspire those environments for other people. I love this. Holly, we're getting a few comments here. Holly says, what a great idea to get these teachers together. Old guys in the balcony are my favorite. (laughs) Uh, Doug Riggle says this, which I love. The first page of the original Star Wars book said they were in the wrong place at the wrong time naturally they became heroes <laughs> so, wow is that right what great three be, lines i love that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time naturally so they became heroes good right? that's so good that's it right i mean my gosh man it is just about it is about in d- dealing with the hardships and the curveballs that we get and we go great man let's deal with it with grace how do we solve this it's Let's figure true. this out. You know, uh, can I ask Paul? Because I know we talked about it earlier, but we didn't get to hear. Was there a teacher or transformative moment for you that sticks out from when you were younger? I think what sticks out the most is that neither of my parents had an idea of what I should be doing, or ever made me felt like I shouldn't be exploring whatever I want to do. And I always like give them so much props for that. You know, my, my father was a music teacher from before I was born. Oh, and wow. My, my parents actually met in band when they were in oh. college. But so my mom played the organ in church. And so I was always around arts. And in high school, I did like everything. I was in every club. I was in every band, choir, leadership, drama. And like they always encouraged me. And they never said anything like maybe you shouldn't be doing that or anything. Yeah. And I grew up playing sports and then in high school I shifted to, to arts and, and they just like, I was always encouraged every step of the way to just follow my heart and do what I want to do. So, wow. Um, I would say, you know, they're obviously natural teachers, your parents, but I don't know. I, I was, I was very lucky and fortunate to be around a lot of really talented uh, artists who were also teachers in my high school and, and college years just mm. like you but um i think that you know what kept the gate open for me was just my parents yeah that's amazing 
I'm sure oh, you've thanked it. It sounds like you give them a lot of a lot of credit for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Parents are amazing. That's amazing. really. I know. You. I mean, not everybody gets that. You know, not everybody has parents that are like that. We have a very close friend. His name's Jim, and he has this story where he was working in his garage on like building creatures and stuff. And his father's like, "What are you doing out there? Why don't you work on? Why don't you go play sports like the other kids?" And he literally, like, the, he's been launching it, but he literally just opened up this space now for his business yes. called Grandest Creations that he's building props for, like, movies and TV. And, you know, so he found his way. And I guess that's that's what I find, too, is that some people, even if your environment sometimes isn't the most welcoming to it, there's still an opportunity to find your way. Thomas, I saw him on Instagram following you, so I'm doing it on. I'm doing it right here. You, you throw him to. my I mean, way, throw yeah. him my way, and put him on the get him, get him on our show. He's such a great guy. He's such a great guy. And okay. truly, when you talk about someone getting in their their zone, he yeah. he he's one of those people you watch work and you're like, oh, this is this is what you've kind of been okay. meant to do. Good. Um, he ch- transforms our front yard every Halloween into like this extraordinary <gasps> thing. No way. He, you are living. You are living. You are living my eight-year-old dream. Man. That's it. You are you not. You're not only living my eight-year-old dream. I've wanted to do this my entire life. Oh god. And let me tell you, he set up a whole thing during the pandemic, and we didn't have a lot of trick or treat. We probably got about fifty, let's say. That's great. But they were coming to our gate, and they were just like mouths agape watching he made a like a jack skellington come to life he had zero like floating around he transformed it in kind of like a quasi you know nightmare before christmas so it was really thomas please please put him in connection with us on the show okay awesome (laughs) so thomas wrap up questions on this okay who is the who is the educators collective for uh the educators collective is primarily focused on um either arts educators Mm -hmm or educators that are open to arts education. Okay, so arts educators or educators that are open to arts. Yeah. I love this, very good. So it's a pretty uh, big swath. I actually have a professor of engineering attending. Okay, cool. So Amazing. that's an example where someone, but he's one of the most creative people that I know. And so he brings that really dynamic package. I love it. Um, please announce one more time. When are the dates for the virtual summit that's so happening for August, this? August 6th through the 8th of 2021. August Just 6th through the 8th. Mm-hmm. And what is the best website? I do have it down the, the, the description, but go ahead and say it. Uh, you know, well, I'm still yeah. just kind of like starting my things. It's really about going, you could go to um, my website, which is teaching artist Thomas dot wordpress.com and there you can see a variety of offerings uh, including the educator summit so it lists my perfect. workshops as well so teaching artist thomas dot wordpress.com perfect because i'm still growing um that's great and yeah. also if you're watching this on youtube or if you're listening to this on the podcast just check in the description because i do have the links to his website that are in there don't go now if you're watching this <laughs> Please wait until the end of this video, oh, this podcast, wow. and then you can. Interesting. We, we don't want to. I don't want. You know what I mean. You want to keep the audience. You want to keep the audience. <laughs> Just for a little bit, and I then they it. can go over. <laughs> I get it. Makes sense. <laughs> um, Thomas, what a pleasure, man! This has been so awesome that this was able to happen. I saw you making this announcement, and I immediately thought, I've got to grab him and get you on the show. And I'm so glad that you were here Me um, too. it's a great it's a great concept you have with the podcast and um i enjoyed talking about it hopefully that was evident and and really sharing the virtual space with the two of you so thanks for creating this space it's a great it's a great concept and you're giving people like me a chance to to talk about it we're happy to do it uh and i'll also toss you one last curveball what's a what's a parting word of wisdom that you would like to give to our audience that's out there oh boy pressure you're right let's see right. parting Word of wisdom. Maybe okay. something that comes up in your heart right now. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So something that's really helped me get through the struggles of the creative process. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw out a name of a, of a writer, um, blogger, author. His name is Mark Manson. And he, he has this concept called the do something principle. And so instead of 
let's start for, with, first with the inversion. The, the inversion would be, I'm going to wait for inspiration to strike and then I'll be motivated and then I'll do something. And he's like, now let's flip it. What you should really consider is the do something principle, which is do something which helps your motivation, which can lead to inspiration. Mm. And he's like, sometimes what the do something is, is you go, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. It can be that accessible. Mm -hmm. And so um, that has worked for me. Like when you're setting up your thing, Kevin, yeah. the do something, not, oh, I want to wait to feel motivated or I want to wait to feel inspired. No. no, do it. And then the other stuff follows. Amen. So good. So good, man. So right in line with the stuff that we're doing here. There it is. Thomas Schulteis, thank you so much for being Kevin, on the show. Kevin, Paul, thanks so much for having me in my two virtual backgrounds. <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's so like wacky. You, it's like you had people draw, bringing in sets, man. It's nuts. We wouldn't mm -hmm. have room for a third. So. No, you really wouldn't. I mean, I've got more, but I think it would be pushing it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you yeah. so much. Make sure that you check out the uh, Thomas's uh, links in the description and go check that out. Paul, how can people help us out here on your creative journey? Oh, that's simple. If you enjoyed the show this evening or this morning, whenever you're listening to it on whatever platform, however you are accessing and streaming it, there's got to be a way to rate it, to like it, to give it some stars, some comments, some positive reviews. That'll help the algorithms, help people who like shows like this, find shows like this, and this show in particular. Uh, we, we don't just need to feel better about ourselves, but we're also just trying to you know help people who need this help find this help right here. Take it very much. Uh, if you liked this, please. Hey, we got a, we got a third. We got a third. I background. had to do it. I we got a third background. It. Well, well, well what are we gonna do? <laughs> Paul, move around a piano in the background. Yeah. Will you get on it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, if you enjoyed the show here today, ladies and gentlemen, please like and subscribe so that you can find out um, when we're doing these shows here on YouTube. Be sure to go to vodacitynetwork.com to see all the awesome variety, wonderful offerings that are over here. And also, uh, you can always see past or listen to past episodes of Your Creative Journey by going to yourcreativejourneypodcast.com, where you can also donate to help support us with server costs and the other things that we have. Uh, and also here on this channel, you can always come back and visit the Kevin Gregg show, uh, where I talk about art, Christianity, history. We'd love to have you here in addition to the Your Creative Journey podcast. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I tell you what I'm going to do. We've had such a great long night. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody at the same time. I'm going to say goodbye to our YouTube folks. Thank you so much for being in the comments. Whenever we do one of these, please feel free to shut Doug Riggle has said bedtime. Bedtime, exactly. <laughs> Everybody's saying thanks, Thomas, for being on the show. We want to thank each and every one of you for being here. Paul, Thomas, love you guys dearly. Thank you for being a part of this. If we only had an Anderson on the show. <laughs> mm, Paul, oh. Thomas, Anderson. I like it. That's it. And then I would just be Kevin. I know exactly. <laughs> and Kevin. Exactly. Paul Thomas Anderson. Kevin. And Kevin. Over there. All him. right. Folks, we will see you next time. I'm going to end it all. <laughs> that really sounded weird, didn't it? <laughs> all right, guys. We'll see you in a couple of weeks for your creative journey. Everybody have a great night. Paul, Thomas, God bless you guys. See you, everybody. Thank you, Kevin.